Welcome, welcome once again to 720 and 720. Uh, very fortunate to have our first NBA guy. We got a lottery pick. Uh, we got a lottery pick from Duke. That sounds pretty cool. I, I guess, William, you, you could say that a bunch of a, a bunch of guys who are lottery picks from Duke. But we got William Avery uh, joining the podcast. William, welcome to 720 and 720. Thank you for having me. Well, we, we are thrilled to have you. And and I, I got a chance to hang out with you last week. And, and everybody's going to love uh, you know, like Duke's got a mystique. What, what's wrong with you guys over there? Like nobody knows what's going on over there at Duke. Y'all got a mystique to you, correct? <laughs> we just try to win, man. We yeah. just try to play hard and win. Yeah, and that pisses off. That, pi- that pisses off, man, because y'all win all. See, everybody hates the winner. You, have you noticed that? Oh yeah. Uh, at Le- like Lebo, so I worked for Lebo. I worked for Jeff. And, and if you mention anything about Duke, boy, it, it would got it. They, he would kill you. And anything about Carolina, he loves. So, I mean, do you have any Carolina friends? Before we get started, do you have any Carolina friends? Actually, I do. Actually, I have two really good friends went to high school with me. Uh, one is working at Campbell, and the other one is working at Northwestern. Uh, two two guys that I'm very close to, and uh, unfortunately, they went to that other school down the road, but... You know, it didn't change them. Yeah, that was a different color blue. That was a different. <laughs> yeah. co- well, what, what we're going to do, what we're going to do, and uh, and what we're trying to do is these podcasts is to help people, not just tell a story, but to help people. And so, trying to help young players, and and um, you know, you're you're working out a bunch of guys and girls right now, but young players, whether they be guys or girls, how does a kid uh, from Augusta, Georgia, hanging out with with Ken Wright? At Augusta West Side, how's a kid go from Augusta uh, to Duke to being a lottery pick? Can you can you start at the beginning? And and the first thing is, I also want you to start with your mom too, because we just yeah. had an unbelievable speaker at the Dr Pepper Classic, and and all he talked about was giving credit to his mom and dad and to to teaching him. Let's this is William Avery, the, the guy, had, and we're gonna have him on. He was born without legs. Uh, mm. And his and his mom his mom and dad made him mow the yard, and and he's out there with his legs, and he said they were falling off while he was trying to mow the yard, and, and he's trying to get this done, and the and the neighbors are sitting there looking at him like, man, those people are crazy making that child. Mow. He said mowing the yard, make his parents making him mow the yard changed his life and gave him a work ethic. So I'm assuming that happened with you because not everybody, like I told you last week, not everybody's William Avery and not everybody's a lottery pick. So now the floor is yours, my my good young man. Well, you know, it started with a dream for me and, you know, my mother, who's been my hero pretty much growing up, sacrificed a lot for me and my sister, but always pushed me, uh, never, you know, never let me take the easy way out. You know, life wasn't, you know, easy for me, you know, and, and being in Augusta, Georgia, you know, a place where, you know, we, we just don't have NBA players falling off a tree, you know, so it was a lot of, uh, you know, negative, you know, toward me, uh, even from my friends growing up, you know, because I would always have a ball in my hand. I would always be somewhere working on my game. And this was a time where. In, at least in my area, it wasn't a lot of gyms, yeah. you know, available to go in. So a lot of that was done outside or in a backyard on a dirt court. Now, hold and, on. Now, hold on now. Hold on now. You mean you went outside and worked on your game outside? <laughs> yes, I, I know that scene. Now, come on. Very, now. very different nowadays. <laughs> and but, you, uh, you worked on your game on a dirt court? The dirt court, you know, the, drunk out of the water holes outside. Don't come back in, you know, to a certain time. Don't go in and out this house. You know, I grew up in that era, you know, which I'm very grateful for. You mean you yeah. can get to the NBA, you can become a lottery pick working on your game outside. And, and also without any trainers. Picture that. How about, yeah. like, tennis balls? <laughs> How about tennis balls and cones? You didn't do no tennis balls, a lot of outside, you know, rubber balls to be Exactly. Rubber balls. Yeah, I know you couldn't take that leather ball outside and mess it up, man. I still <laughs> yell right. at my kids about that. All right, so yeah. you're out there working. You're out there working because it's really nice and cool. You know, the, the coolest places in the summer 
are Columbia, <laughs> Columbia, South Carolina, and Augusta, Georgia. They're the most Thanks. pleasant places in the summer to be. A lot of humidity, a lot of mosquitoes. Oh. You know. well, so, so you're out there grinding in the summer. How old were you when you got started? Six years old. And actually, uh, my, my grandmother's house, that's where all the neighborhood pickup games were. Uh, so I started watching my mom and other people from the neighborhood, you know, just get after it on this dirt court. And, you know, it didn't take long before I figured out this is what I definitely want to do. And then as I continue to work, you know, I figured out this would be a way that I could pay for college because my situation, my mom just didn't have a, any money put away for me to go to college. You know, we were basically living, you know, check to check. My mother had me when she was 17 years old and, during the time she was raising me, she was both going to school and working, you know, so it was, so it was tough. So it's kind of started as my way to, to help her. Like I'm going to, you know, work on my game and get college paid for, you know, doing this without my mother having to go take out any uh, loans and stuff for me to get an education. So you started at that. Okay. So you're six years old. You're out there watching and and all of a sudden, when did you really kind of get serious about it? When I know you were like we talked about the other day, you're like 11 and 12, and all of a sudden you saw, hey, I was, I, I'm pretty good. Actually, the first time I was able to participate in AAU Nationals, it opened my eyes up to a lot of things. i never forget I was about 10 years old uh, playing with what's now the Atlanta Celtics. At the time, we were the Atlanta Warriors, and i never forget – uh, in that same tournament, my pool was uh, Khalid Alamine, and, and that same event was Bonzi Wells. You know, just seeing guys, and you know, for me, I thought at my age, I'd always been the best player, you know, in my area and where I was from. But it was the first time I started seeing guys that were as good as I was, or if not even better. And it made me go home and continue to work. Uh, so, so when you I, say you went home and continue to work, give us a, give us a, like a normal, like a, just start at age 10. Give us a normal day of going to work and you didn't have a trainer, you didn't have cones, you didn't have tennis ball. What would you do? I'm assuming you just, would just, just flat out working play. On, working <laughs> on my weaknesses. I really started, you know, focusing on the things that I couldn't do, the things I couldn't do well, while also continue to develop my strength. I was always a pretty good shooter. But, you know, work on my ball handling, work on going left, work on shooting with my left hand, you know, working on being in, in better shape, uh, getting stronger. You know, I was always told you shouldn't lift weights till you get 14 years old. So it's a lot of, you know, push-ups and, and sit-ups and calf raises. And i never forget a guy named Sam Ward that worked at the Boys and Girls Club. He's like, you know, Will, if you want to dunk, man, you got to do this, do this exercise. And he, he would give me 10 pennies. And I would squat down and place the 10 pennies down, and then I would walk backwards and pick them up. And what I was doing was squatting with my body weight as I was putting down and picking up the pennies. So just, you know, a lot of exercise. If I told a kid that today, he'd probably look at me like I'm crazy. But, <laughs> well, I, I tell you, know. you what I like about that story is, is every one of us – I mean, listen, man, you're William Avery. You, you're a lottery pick. You play for Coach K. You're with the T-Wolves. Uh, and, and one guy who made a huge difference in your life is a guy named Sam Ward at the Dagum Boys and Girls Club in Augusta. That's so right. We all have – that's what's great about journeys is we all have these guys who no one's ever heard of, all right, and they don't even know how important they are, but, but they all they, – they had such an impact on all you guys and everybody who's kind of made it. You can always look back to, like, that guy. And that's, right. and that's really cool, man. I'm, I'm glad you gave him some props. That's good. All right, continue. Yeah, and uh, and so I would – and I speaking of, of Ken Wright, by the time I came 12, 13 years old, I was this, you know, exceptional middle school player, and he was the high school that I was going to feed into. And I remember when I was playing in the eighth grade, the high school coach always being at my, at my games. And – you know, back then, that would be like if a college coach was watching a high school player. So it was a big deal. To yep. him. And uh, he would always, no matter if they played on the same night, he would at least watch a half every time I played. And uh, and so I was excited about getting to the next level. I also was excited that, 
you know, this coach was taking an interest in me, you know, so early. And I never forget that the last day of school, he called me to start coming in to work out. And so I go to the school. I'm excited. I'm thinking it's going to be the whole team. No, it was two eighth graders, me and one of my teammates. And we were just doing individual work. He was, you know, teaching me how to come off screens and turn on that inside foot and square up and shoot the ball. You know, a lot of things he taught me, I carry with me throughout my professional career. And I still teach it to kids now. You know, he just he just really taught me all the fundamentals, you know, that I needed to play the game. You mean Ken Wright didn't have anything else to do but just hang out with, you know, <laughs> and, and that's what's neat. You know, I, I this is a side note. I reached out to Steve Smith. Everybody, Steve Smith's the head coach of Oak Hill and coached uh, William Avery later on. And I said, I just hung out with, with William Avery, and, and he, lo- he loves you, man. And he said, I love him back. And he said, it's always, and this is Steve Smith, he said, it's always been about relationships. And and I, I was like, you know, I mean, you just kind of keep getting reminded of it. So, I mean, you loved Ken Wright. Ken Wright loved you. He showed you interest and showed he cared for you in eighth grade. And it's continued forever. You know, and I, I've been lucky in that aspect to play for, play for not only really good basketball minds, but really good people. And, and like you said, it is all about relationships. So when I'm training or I, I have the time to invest in a young person with teaching them things or, you know, get the opportunity to coach them, it's about building that relationship. You know? and, and one of the things I learned with that is if, if kids know you care about them and, you, you know, you have a genuine interest in them, you, you're allowed to, you know, push them a little more, you know, because they know it's for their best interest. You know, you can get on them a little more. And that's what I've enjoyed, you know, when working with young people, just the relationship I've, I've built over time. And now I have kids that I've had when they were in middle school. Now they're in college and getting ready for that journey, you know, as a professional. So it's been really great, you know, to be able to share the things that these great people have shared with me and taught me, you know, with someone else, you know. But, you know, but back back to high school, so, you know, I, I've – Coach Wright's team reaches the state quarterfinals the previous year, and they're returning, you know, both guards. So during the summer, I'm like, I got to work, I got to work, just, you know, to earn some, just to maybe play varsity. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he, he did a really good job developing me in the summer, uh, playing summer ball, and and the, off the starting shooting guard decides to play football for the first time in his high school career. <laughs> You know, I didn't think nothing of it at the time. I'm, you know, I'm still thinking, you know, he's going to be fine. Coach Wright comes to me uh, midway through through the uh, off season and says, "Well, Will Troyce is on the football field, so right now, that's your starting position to lose." And that was all I needed to hear because I knew he wasn't going to take my position. Absolutely, you know, that, that Wally Wally Pip and Lou Gehrig. That's all that was. Uh, that's it. You know. And, uh, and so I, I started as a freshman the first game. I scored, you know, 23 points. And everybody like, whoa, who's this guy? And we play again the next night, and I scored 23 again. And, you know, from there, the, the rest was kind of history. You know, I became a household name. But what that did is it created a target on my back. And uh, so now I got to keep improving because people are saying – Yo, he's he's better than you know everybody else in, in high school, and so everybody's coming at me every night. So that gave me the motivation motivation to continue to work. I, I, uh, I love I love when young guys. I just had to coach against Darius Garland, who's going to be a lottery pick this upcoming NBA draft, and I saw Garland as a freshman. And, you know, at, like you as a freshman at, at Westside, you get a couple games where they're, they're just called free games. No one knows you yet. You get whatever you want. It's easy. Now, when you become that first line on that scouting report and everything's geared, you better improve or you can't sustain. And and right. Garland, Garland improved every single – he got so much better because, yeah, hey, we can do this to him. No, we can't do that to him. And so you figured it out early. If you don't get better, you're really getting worse. That's that's right. And and I had a coach that never let me become complacent. I remember the first time I saw you know myself being ranked after I attended the ABCD camp. 
uh, my sophomore year, and I think I came out of there. I was the 14th ranked player in my class, and Coach Wright looked at that magazine. You know, all the kids were around talking about it. And he was like, 14. It's like, so somebody thinks there's 13 other people <laughs> better than you at your age. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, a lot of people is like, hey, man, that's great, man. 14, man, you're 14. I mean, it, yeah. but you got to look at things how you got to look at things. So he was vital in your in your development. Uh, definitely and uh you know that, that right there just you know pushed me some more and i took it like hey you know i should be one you know why why am i not not number one and uh continue to work and you know by the end of that season i was number five in the first at my position you know so he, he you know he pushed me and uh he gave me the tools to develop my game and i'm you know very thankful for that and you know i left he left uh, after my junior year and went to tennessee and that's when I made the decision to go to Mouth of Wilson, Virginia, at Ten Oak Hill Academy. So you if know, he, if Ken Wright would have stayed at West Side, you were staying. I would have stayed at West Side. Now, now yeah. Ricky Moore. Okay, so people got to understand. Now you. Now was Ricky older than you? Ricky, yeah. Ricky was two years ahead of me. Okay. In school. All right. We played together for two years. So Ken Wright probably got since he had Avery and Ricky Moore. He probably got five years like extension towards his retirement because that's a pretty that's a pretty good basketball <laughs> team. You know, Ken yes, always said yes. he was a good coach, and then I looked back at his teams, I was like, Ken, uh, my 13-year-old could have coached Ricky Moore and William Avery, my friend. Uh, so he left going in going in your senior year, he went to Tennessee. Yes. And then just to tell you how, how good of a, a team we were, you know, and how good of a coach he was, he never had an assistant. Well, <laughs> he never had an assistant coach. And my sophomore year, we finished ninth in the country. You know, this is a public school in the area where kids just went to school where they live. Yep. It wasn't all this transferring stuff and let's hire the that, do, that doesn't but, that doesn't happen william in uh, in georgia <laughs> what are you talking about kids just go in their district man in there everything was was authentic you know you went to school where you lived the bus came and picked you up you know in your street and uh you know so that that was pretty impressive and you know that year we knocked off uh science hill caught in the ritter and Paul Robeson, who were all top 25 teams at the time we played them, and all had, you know, pretty good basketball players. Well, you know, and I, I who knows, I, I, I need to get George Pitts from Science Hill on there with you. But to beat, for people to understand is to beat Science Hill in the championship game of the Arby's Classic, with with George Pitts and that great team, but also with uh, Dale Burns running the tournament, and I love Dale, but Dale would have George's uncle, cousin, and uh, brother-in-law uh, officiate that final game. To beat Science Hill in that time, in that era, at Arby's, was probably your best win of the year because nobody did that at that time. No doubt about it. And I think at the time they were ranked like fourth in the country. Yeah. You know, you know no, no doubt about it. It was – and I can say that because I'm a East, I'm a East Tennessee redneck. That's why I'm allowed to say what I'm saying about about because I knew how good they were. So y- y'all are rock and roll ranked ninth in the country, and then yeah. and then Ken Wright flees you and goes to Tennessee and double dips. Correct? Yeah, he he, he, he left, and uh, you know at the time it was tough. You know, as a kid to understand, you know him, you know leaving me. You know, <laughs> you know we we had done so much together. Yeah. And, you know, I was just, you know, coming into my own, and uh, and 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 that's when Oak Hill came about, and uh, and and I can say this, um, one thing I learned at Oak Hill was, you know, I, I got a chance to get better every day in practice, and I didn't have that once Ricky Moore graduated. Yeah. You know, we could push each other. My junior year, I didn't have that, and uh, and I always said. Had I not gone to Oak Hill, my development would have took a little longer at Duke, you know, because I'm in an environment where I get to play against other college players on a daily basis, and I also get to play the most competitive high school schedule in the country. You know, so those things help with my development at Duke. So who was with you at Oak Hill? Jermaine Medley, who played at Villanova. Uh, Telecos, we played at Pittsburgh. Kevin Lyde went to Temple. Suleiman Kamara went to Kentucky. 
uh, D. Tolliver went to UNC Charlotte. You know, so we had a pretty good group that year. And, and so all of a sudden you are at Oak Hill. Um, you're playing uh, with the with with the Georgia Stars at that moment in the summer, correct? Yes. So you've made the you've made the trek through AAU, and that was a different time. It was still you could still go to individual camps. So you were a Nike guy. You started an Adidas guy, then you went up to Indianapolis, become a Nike guy. Um, yeah. And so when when did uh who did come down to between in, in recruiting, and when did they offer, and how they offer? You know what? I I still to this day, you know, I know all these kids. They post on social media when they get an offer and things like that. I don't remember like just <laughs> just saying, "Hey, we're all for you." I, I really don't remember. I just remember guys, you know, hey, you know, you want to come here, you know, yeah. we'd love to have you. But you know, we did make a big deal about this offer thing. But you know, my final five schools and the schools I visited were. Virginia, Syracuse, Georgia, Duke, and Kentucky, and it really came down to Duke and Kentucky in the end. Yeah, tell everybody who you are. If you, if somebody would have stayed at Kentucky, you'd have been at Kentucky. Yeah, uh, you know, pr- probably yes. I was a, uh, you know, really like you know the way Kentucky was playing at the time, the pressing and shooting threes, and uh, you know Rick Rick Pitino, and you know had Rick Pitino stayed at Kentucky, you know, I probably would have, you know, end up at Kentucky. Golly, yeah. that's going to make every Kentucky fan who's ever listened to this just furious. <laughs> uh, all right, so all of a sudden uh, it comes down and you're going to go to Duke. I don't even know. Tell me at that time, how'd you let them know? At Duke, well, Tommy Amcrack came up to the school to, to watch practice that day. And, uh, you know, at this time I was re- really, uh, you know, really liking – you know, what Coach K had done with it, with his guards and stuff. And I, you know, contemplated several times with it. And, and what I looked at is, you know, if I didn't make it professionally, you know, that that Duke education, I would still be okay. And I'll never forget, you know, I was going to get water. And uh, I was just like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to come to Duke. Yeah, <laughs> well, I know you made a lot of people happy at, at, at that moment. Uh, tell me, side note, because we did a we did a podcast with Billis real quick. Uh, side note, tell me the most special things about Coach K and what makes him special. His his, his leadership quality, but his ability to communicate. You know, I, it was the first time I had ever been around. You know, a coach that knew which buttons to push for every guy. You know, he, he, he could get the best out of every kid. And, and, and that was amazing to me. And just, just how well he knew his players. And, you know, how, you know, he how different he was with my with me from my freshman year to my sophomore year. How he really pushed me and, and made me earn everything to my sophomore year. He was there to make sure I stayed confident and kind of unleash me a little bit because he knew what I had in me, inside me as a player. How, and, how uh, do you get those type of relationships? I, I, I just think, you know, just, just being around each other and, you know, time and, you know, being honest with, with one another and, you know, things like that. Being honest. So not, not yeah. sugarcoating and kissing yeah. your tail, being honest. You know, it's, he never did that with me. <laughs> well, I, I'll just tell you this, and, and, and we hadn't had him on a podcast, but I got a chance to hang out with Kevin Eastman, who was with the Celtics. And he says, the higher level you go, and, and dealing with pros, you know, like some college guys want you to kiss or tell a little bit and sugarcoat everything. He said, pros, all pros want is the truth. And all pros want is the truth. Tell me the truth. Tell me how I can get better. Tell me what I got to do because I can make more money if I get better. Just tell me the truth. And and I don't know if you felt like that as a pro but or if you or Coach K did that with you when you were at Duke, but – you know, sometimes that's that's a pretty good way to do things. It is, and and it was great. And and when I became a professional, you know, it, it didn't happen that way all the time. You know, you, you're not going to get the truth. Now you have to understand that it's a business. You know, and it, it, it's just a lot different. Well, I mean, I, I and he. All right, so so you're you're at. 
So you finish your year. At, what type of year y'all have at Oak Hill? Y'all like the typical forty-eight okay, and two. We started off the year ranked number two. Uh, very tough schedule. And actually, just a funny thing. We went thirty and five. And it was the most losses I'd ever had in my high school career the season. <laughs> you, you need know? to tell Ken Wright, said coach. Hey, Steve <laughs> Smith, I'm sorry, man, but we, but we'd have beaten you down in Augusta. So I mean, so you went thirty and five, and that was a bad year for you. That that was a bad year. We finished probably like twenty two in the country, but uh, you know we had two losses to Tracy McGrady's group, which you know is probably nothing to be ashamed of. Another one came at the hands of Lamar Odom, another one to Khalid Alavine's team, and uh, the other one, and it's crazy that I remember this stuff, and the other one came to which Frank Williams, Sergio McClain, and Marcus Griffin, who at the time were three, you know, really good high school basketball players. Is that up Illinois. Illinois? Were they Illinois kids? Yes, yes. And Peoria Emanuel, yep. you know, they were one and we were two, and i never forget we're playing in the Kiel Center, and it's 20,000 people, and and uh, their Adidas team, and, you know, we're Nike, and so you got, you know, the George Ravlins and the Sonny Vaccaros at the game. It, it was a pretty big deal, you know. You do a docu- I, You could do a documentary just on that game. <laughs> That's right. I, I finished with 20 and 8, and, you know, it was probably one of the worst games I played, you know. Well, uh, just, all right. So we get done with Oak Hill, and now we're making our trek to Duke. Um how hard of a transition and tell us about Duke and coach K and practice. And, uh, at that moment, y'all were still pressuring the ball and denying everything. I think at that moment, that's right. And, you know, I have, I get to go head to head every day against the national defensive player of the year. And, you know, current Marquette her head coach, Steve Wojciechowski. Well, and, all right. You told me a couple of stories about him. You said this is the greatest leader that you've ever been around. No, no question. I, him and Kevin Garnett are the greatest things I think I ever had a chance to play with. Well, and let's let's help some coaches now. So so let's help coaches and players right now. What made KG and and Wojo as good as they were as leaders? Yeah, first of all, just bringing it every day. You know, giving one hundred and ten percent at practice every day, being on time. And the thing I loved about, it, especially Wojo. You know who, you know he, he wasn't going to be a top five pick in the draft or anything like that. But he was leading at the time the number one team in the country, and he wasn't afraid to get on whomever. You know wasn't playing up to the standard we needed them to play at to be successful. You know, and well, and he, you know, and I never remember him being you know sick. You know, being like if, if he was if he set out or anything, it was doctor's orders. You know, so they and show I, they show up. They they said they you know they said at KG like like Doc would say uh, KG you gonna take today off man we are gonna get you rested and while they're scrimmaging he's sprinting up and down the floor while they're running. Oh oh, oh yeah, I, I I remember God bless that flip Saunders could never get him to sit out of practice, never. You know, and he he was probably a thirty eight to forty minute guy. You know, at that time, you know, early on and. You know, he would ne- he could he could never get him to sit out of practice. You know, he 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 wanted to practice just as much as he wanted to play the games. Well, I mean, I mean, yeah. to me, he's one of the greatest leaders and competitors that ever played a game. I yes, mean, I mean, he was brutal. So I mean, so so you're around like so you're around Wojo every daggum day. <laughs> you know, I mean, trying to figure it out uh, how to guard him. He's guarding you, and he's probably got half your talent. That, that, that's right. And- be better. I mean, he gave it to me every day. Picked me up full court. You know, and, and you know it's tough. You got to run this set. He knows what you're running. He knows you're trying to run run the play right to stay on coach's good side, and he's right up in you. You know, <laughs> taking away everything, and he's gonna force you to use your talent. You know, and create a play. And uh, he made me a better player because of that. Well, and he's doing a good job. He's doing a great job at Marquette. So you, so you got Wojo. You got Wojo every day in practice. Coach Gay into you every single day. Bunch of energy in there. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Without a doubt. You know, and, and, and that was another thing. Like, coach is big on communicating, so we talked through every drill. You know, we we made that a habit. You know, one of the things Wojo was able to do if if we didn't have the energy, coach didn't have to stop it. 
Wojo was stopping and bring everybody together well, so we could pick it up. I've always said a, a, a coach's led team is, is pretty good, but a player's led team has is, is got a chance to be special. If you got guys exactly in there right. who are leading and being special and being vocal and and talking and communicate, you got a chance and to be. Yeah. You got a chance to be good. That's uh, right. And that's what Wojo. Did you take that from Wojo? Were you Wojo that next year when he left? You know, I, I did a lot by example. Probably not as vocal as he was. You know, but I did a lot by example. I would say, you know, Shane Battier picked up that role. You know, the next year vocally. You know, I would just bring it every day and, you know, and, and you know, p- practice hard and, you know, push each- push everyone like that. But vocally, I would say Shane Battier, you know, took that role. Well, okay, tell me about Battier as a leader. Great leader? Battier is great, too. De- de- definitely great. You know, at the time, you know, Battier was, you know, was, was a role guy. You know, he wasn't the, you know, Naismith player of the year, which he ended up being, you know, by his senior year. But... He was great on defense. I mean, he would – I love pressuring the ball because you could always hear him behind you, you know, <laughs> so you knew you had help, which gave you more confidence to pressure the basketball because you knew where he was and where to send guys. And he was well, always talking. There you, you know? go. There you go, young guys out here listening and players and coaches. You got a lottery pick saying, listen, man, I love playing defense with Batty because he talked. He gave you Definitely. comfort by talking. Definitely, yeah. I mean, because I see point guards, I see point guards out there guarding, especially in today's day and age, with all the flat ball screens and the twist and all the all the different. They're scared to death they're gonna get hammered, and so if you don't have somebody chirping behind them and tell them what's going on, they got no trust in their teammate. They're not gonna pressure the ball and they're not gonna get things started for you. And I love to play ball screens with, with Shane because no matter what we were doing, if we got you know caught in that great area we were always going to be okay because he was always communicating. So we're always going to be on the same page. You know, it's, it's not brain surgery. All you got to do is talk your way through it. Just talk That's your way it. through it. And instead of guessing, and if you don't open your mouth, you have no idea what he's going to do. All you got, even in an emergency situation, you just switch a ball screen. Hey man, switch, switch. I got it. Yep. I got, and That's then everything's right. taken care of. And so yeah. kids don't understand that. I will say this about Battier, and listen, I was the least talented. I'm the least talented person that you know in your life, William Avery. I'm just going to tell you that. But but Battier wasn't the most talented guy to come out of Duke. He wasn't the most talented guy in the NBA. Now tell me now, William Avery, how many years did Shane Battier play in the league? I want to say about 13. <laughs> okay, now, so I, I coached against the Fab Five. Uh, we were in the NCAA tournament. It was in the second round, and and we got uh, Chris Weber, and we got we got to guard Jalen Rose, and we got to guard Jimmy King, and we we got to guard Ray Jackson. We got to guard all these guys, and probably the least talented one of them was a guy named Jawan Howard. Now he was a big dude, but he was probably the least talented one of the Fab Five. No one really talked about him. All right, but he was their leader, and and. How many years later, when, when Weber was done playing and Rose was done playing and all those guys were done playing, who was still playing? Jawan Howard. That's right. That's right. And so if you if you can be a leader and you can have some stuff on the inside, man, you can last forever because people love leadership. They love it. Um, all right, tell me, tell us. All right, so your first year at Duke, your first do year at, at Duke. Tell us about that. I, I, I how successful you guys were. We finished. 32 and four and a loss in the lead eight to a good Kentucky team in a game where we were up 19 points and uh, you know, we, we just blew the lead and, and ended up losing. But, you know, I, I can tell you, you know, practice was, we, we had, we had so many guys, you know, pr- practice was like games, you know, that, that first year we really had, you know, 10 guys that can really get after us. You know, any day you can lose your spot. You know, that that's how, you know, talented that group was. You know, we, you know, you would love those battles on the wings with, you know, Sean McLeod, Shane Battier, Chris Carrollwell, Nate James, uh, you know, and then Chris Burgess and Elton Brand in the paint, you know, <laughs> myself and Wojo at the point. You know, pr- practice was, was tough, intense. But it was fun, you know. We pushed each other, and and, and we be, 
became better individually, and as a result, we became better as a team. But I, I, I can tell you, we finished 15 and one in the ACC that year, and it was the first time that had been done. But you know, that conference play was something I had never experienced. The, the ACC is, is no joke. You know, especially when guys get to see you for that second time and they know everything you're doing, everything you're running. And it's a very, very tough league. Well, one of my guys, one of my guys, William, is, is Charlton Young. He's assistant at Florida State. And they, yeah, CY. Yeah, CY. And, and CY, they, they made a run. They made a run last year in the NCAA tournament, got to the Elite Eight. And he said once they got to the NCAA tournament, it was like compared to the ACC, it was like easy. It was yeah. like, man, we just get to play them. That, that's a lot easier than playing Duke and Carolina and Virginia and Syracuse and 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 Virginia Tech, NC State, Clemson. It was ridiculous. He was like, the NCAA was easy compared to the ACC. I, I could agree with that. It's a very very tough league. You know, the the following season, uh, you know, we go sixteen and zero in that league and break our own record. You know, but that tells you how good those teams were. As tough as this league, you know, is we we went fifteen and one and and sixteen and zero. And you know, I was I never lost a game in Cameron. You know, and uh, you, you never lost a home team. game. Never lost a home game. That's, and, that's uh, not so. that's not a bad record there, William Avery. <laughs> so so your second year, so you're a sophomore at Duke. You're rocking and rolling. Uh, you go sixteen and zero. Um, uh, tell us about your 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 ride in the NCAA tournament because it was a pretty special one. We're, we're rolling, man. At, at this point, you know we're we're everybody said we could possibly be one of the best teams ever. We you know we we've gone we went thirty three straight games uh, before losing the national championship. But you know we're extremely focused. We have experience. We have talent, and uh, we we just think you know it's our time. You know, we, we get in the NCAA tournament and we're, you know, blowing people away and some good teams. I'll never forget that really good Temple team my sophomore year. In the, we beat in the Elite Eight uh, playing that matchup zone with yep. Mark Karcher and Lynn Greer and uh, uh, Lamont Barnes and Kevin Lyde. A real good group, you know, maybe one of the better groups that Cheney had. Uh, you know, we, we beat them in the Elite Eight. You know, had they not, you know, ran against us, they probably would have easily been a Final Four team. People people hated playing Temple in the NCAA tournament. Why? Because they played something unique. They had a yeah. un, unique D, and it made people feel uncomfortable. You had to change. You didn't have a lot of time to prepare for them. It was probably easier to prepare for them on one of those Thursday-Friday games instead of the second game when you all played them. Um, yeah. Because you, don't, you, you got one day to prepare for all that mess. That's right. That's, that's right. Um, and, uh, but there you go. You're, you're headed to the Final Four. And we're in the final four, and we get Michigan State for the second time, the second time that season. And you know, usually how good is those groups get by that time of yep. year. You know? And we play them in the, the Great Eight early on in Chicago and beat them, and, and we catch them in the final four. And that team had the team Cleese, Morris Peterson, uh, Charlie Bell, you know, re- re- really good players. And now they they're really good and at the time. Uh, when we played them the first time, a team Cleve was probably preseason first team All American, and was going to be the first guard taken, maybe. And um, you know, so they're really good. That didn't motivate you at all, did it? <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I understand. <laughs> and, uh, just just a little bit, and you know, this game is tight, and El Brand gets some foul trouble, and I never forget. You know, during the timeout, Coach K looking at me and telling me that, you know, Will, right now you're going to have to get really cocky with the ball. And 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 that goes back to that communication and and knowing your player. Yeah, he knew. You know, that's all I needed to hear. You know, <laughs> so, so now I, I get going and, and uh, in a stretch and a very important stretch. Why you know Elton Brand, is the college player of the year that season, you know, was on the bench. You know, I, I keep things going and keep us afloat, and uh, we go on to win. And then. Uh, Championship game versus UConn, another really good team. Richard Hamilton led group, uh, Khalid Alamine, uh, my old high school teammate, Richard Moore. So you're playing against your high school teammate in the national championship game. Yes. Did yes. Ken Wright at least come to the game? 
I, I don't think he made it to the game. He probably couldn't afford a ticket being up in tennis, coaching in Tennessee. <laughs> it didn't make him money. Uh, so, so you're playing UConn in the championship. Yes, U- UConn, and you know all they've heard is you know how good Duke is, and you know they got nothing to lose, and they, and they have a really good team, really good. You know, it's probably the only team in the country as good as we were in transition, and uh, you know they got they got a lottery pick out there as well. <laughs> And Richard Hamilton, and um, you know, good game going back and forth all night. It, it, it basically came down to a few plays, you know, late in the game that we didn't execute, and uh, and they did. And uh, you know, hats off. Always say, you know, if it was a series, we would easily win. But unfortunately, it's not how it works. Just whoever's better that day, and, you know, they came out on top. So you go back to Duke, and you're getting ready to roll. You're getting ready for your junior year, pumped up. Uh, y'all gonna be good again, and then all of a sudden some stuff starts hitting you, and um, all of a sudden you become one of the first guys to to ever leave Duke early. Uh, how yeah. was how was that experience? It, it was tough because I loved being at Duke. You know, it was I, I loved everything about it. Uh, it was family. You know, and it, it was tough, and, and you know, fortunately we, you know, have to make those decisions. I was in a tough situation financially. And, uh, and, and it was also my dream to play in the NBA. And so now I have that, you know, the palm of my hands, and I made the decision to pursue my dream. Well, and, uh, a, a lottery pick, a lottery pick, and um, yeah. playing with the T-Wolves and, and having that opportunity from a, that little kid playing on the, in the, on the dirt court that I don't think kids can un- really understand uh, was probably a pretty good journey for you. Definitely was, and I don't regret anything about it. Uh, it's, it's made me who I am today, and uh, you know, only a few people ever get that opportunity. <laughs> I tried to tell you that the other day. You don't even realize it. Uh, for our list, I mean, William Avery's one of the nicest guys around. I was like, William, man, you don't have to be nice to me. Man. You're William Avery. You're a lottery pick. Uh, but but you, you stayed very normal and very humble, and, and um, I'm assuming that's probably because how you were raised. Uh, yeah. uh, give, give players, I mean, give us, give the players here, like, what are the three keys, man? What are the three, not to play at Duke, because that's the special, that's the elite. But but what made you good? What made you different? First and foremost, you have to believe in yourself. If you don't believe in yourself, you know, no, nobody else will. You have to believe in yourself. You have to work extremely hard and understand that if there are going to be some people out there some players more talented than you but you should never be outworked and 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 you have to own it you know and, well so my uh, question to you is how do you believe in yourself because i think you just answered it with your second part of it. how do you get belief in yourself as a player by working on your game which will instill confidence yeah right? and uh you know if you if you shot 300 made 300 threes a day you know, you're going to be confident in taking that three in the game because you've made that shot over and over and over. William Avery, why is it so hard? I mean, to me, it's the easiest thing in the world. I wasn't a great student, but whenever I studied for my algebra test and I really studied and I really knew the material, I wasn't nervous going and taking a test. The only time I ever got nervous taking tests when I had no idea what I was doing. All right? So why the same thing on the basketball court. Why is it so hard for kids to understand that? That if you go spend time on the court and you're making 500 threes a day, then playing in a game shooting a three is no big deal. Yeah, it goes back to the old John Wooden quote, you know, not preparing is preparing to fail. Yeah. You know? it, it's, it's unbelievable to me. But you're preparing kids right now. How many kids, as you're working out kids in Augusta, how many kids uh, do you have playing on some level in college? In the last four years, uh, twenty-eight. That's great. Over, over the last over the last four years, and uh, that number is going to continue to grow. I got a text yesterday from one of my young kids who I've had uh, since she was in the fifth grade, and she's in the eighth grade. And this year, she won the middle school and JV county championship. And uh, you know, she was just you know thanking thanking me for the work you know that I. <laughs> The time I poured into her, and you know, I needed to let her know that 
she's the one to put on put in the work you know i've been able to guide her but she's been the one putting in the work and uh so she just has to continue to do to do that and i you know appreciate her and her family for trusting in me you know to guide her and i'm, I'm just glad to be a part of her journey well, it's the same thing that Ken Wright did for you. Don't ever forget that. As as, as special as that was when Ken Wright was sitting in that stand with you, uh, you go watch you go watch her play, and you're there for her. It's the same deal. You're just paying it forward. You're that's just right. yeah. You just whatever Ken did for you, you're just paying it back, and that's what you're supposed to do. And um, I just want to tell you, man, thank you so much uh, for being with us today, for helping young coaches and players for letting us get the inside of KG and, and, and coach K and what made those guys special, uh, because you're special and you know, listen, man, we all watch your career and very few of us get to do what you did. And, um, to, to have an idea on what it took to get to where you were is pretty special for us to learn. I enjoyed it, man. Well, listen, man, we really appreciate your time. Um, I know those kids in Augusta are very fortunate to have you. Uh, you know, there's a kid, I, I busted your tail in. If you'd have done a little bit more with Charlie Bernstein uh, in Augusta when he came to Macaulay, he could have led Macaulay to a state championship, and he just didn't get it done. No, that's the other neat thing about you. Charlie, this little kid, Charlie Bernstein, is this little kid at Macaulay uh, who, who loves the game but wasn't ever going to be great in the game. And I know for a fact, that you put as much heart and love and care and work in that kid as you do the more talented ones. It doesn't matter, does it? Doesn't, not, not at all. If, if, if you're there, and I tell them all the time, if you, know, you come and show up, you're going to get better. You know How much better, that's on you. But if you come and show up, you'll get better. There you go. That's all I need to hear. William Avery, thanks so much for being on 720 and 720. Thank you. Take care, buddy.